Good evening and welcome. My name is Erin Bishop. I am the director of the Center for Christian Spirituality here at USD. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this evening to our event, The Name of God is Relationship with Franciscan friar Daniel Horan. I'd like to especially welcome members of the Society of the Sacred Heart, whose order helped to found USD, and whose sisters established the center that brings you tonight's lecture. I'd also like to thank Jeffrey Burns with the Center for Catholic Thought and Culture and the whole staff of University Ministry for their co-sponsorship tonight. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would ask you to take a moment to silence both your cell phones and perhaps your hearts by joining me in taking a moment to center ourselves in a prayerful way with a blessing by the Irish poet and author John O'Donohue. For longing. Blessed be the longing that brought you here and quickens your soul with wonder. May you have the courage to listen to the voice of desire that disturbs you when you have settled for something safe. May you have the wisdom to enter generously into your own unease, to discover the new direction your longing wants you to take. May the forms of your belonging, in love, creativity, and friendship, be equal to the grandeur and the call of your soul. May the one you long for long for you. May your dreams gradually reveal the destination of your desire. May a secret providence guide your thought and nurture your feeling. May your mind inhabit your life with the sureness with which your body inhabits the world. May your heart never be haunted by ghost structures of old damage. May you come to accept your longing as divine urgency. May you know the urgency with which God longs for you. Amen. Please do come forward and sit in the front row. <laughs> You're all welcome to come forward. Tonight's speaker, Father Dan Haran, is many things. First and foremost, he is a Franciscan friar of the Holy Name province, living out a priestly call to ministry in the spirit of St. Francis. He's also a columnist for America Magazine, the National Catholic Weekly run by the Jesuits, and author of several books, including Dating God, Live and Love in the Way of St. Francis, and Francis of Assisi and the Future of Faith, Exploring Franciscan Spirituality and Theology in the Modern World. In addition to the Franciscan theological, philosophical, and spiritual tradition, Father Dan has written and lectured on various themes in spirituality, the life and work of Thomas Merton, and various themes in contemporary systematic theology. He's currently completing his PhD in systematic theology at Boston College, but travels frequently as a lecturer and retreat director around the world. And we are delighted to have him here with us tonight in Founders Chapel at USD. Please join me in warmly welcoming Father Dan Haran. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Can you hear me okay? All right. How about those over in Tijuana in the back of the chapel? Can you still hear me? We've got sort of an international gathering here. The distance is so great, I feel like we've crossed the border. We're so separated. So, I hope that uh, we'll be able to connect in some way. Can you see the screen? Probably not. Did you bring your telescopes? Okay. Um, it's really a joy to be with you and to be in this chapel again. I had the great privilege last night uh, to celebrate the Eucharist with, with some of you, uh, members of the USD community. And it's, it's been just a, a tremendous treat and a great joy to be here these last few days. I just want to uh, express my thanks before we get rolling here to, uh, to Aaron Bishop and to the uh, Center of, uh, for Christian Spirituality here at USD as well to echo Aaron's thanks to, to Jeff Burns and the, uh, the Center here for Catholic Thought and Culture. It's, it's a real uh, honor and joy and to be able to say yes to their invitation to spend some time with you. 
And to reflect on this question about the name of God, who is God, and how might we think in new ways about our relationship to this God I want to call relationship. So let me give you just a little overview, a kind of map for where I'd like to go this evening. I want to talk first about the question and the journey. I want then to kind of offer a bit of a disclaimer, we might say, and talk a little bit about what we cannot know about. Then take a look at maybe something or some things that we can know. Rather, who can we know? Then circle around to this name of God, which is maybe why some of you are here, intrigued by the title, what is this Franciscan friar really going to talk about? And then open it up to you. We'll have some time, hopefully, uh, for some conversations, some discussions, questions, not necessarily satisfying answers, perhaps, on my part, insults, you know, all those kinds of things you'd like to level my way. That'll be afterwards. But first, let's begin with the question in the journey. For some, these subjects will be familiar, some of the things I'm going to talk about right now. But for others, maybe this is brand new, or it's an invitation to think about faith and spirituality, about prayer and our relationship to God in new or novel ways. What is the name of God? This is my question. It's a question I want to pose to you. It's a question I ask myself and continue to ask myself. It's one of many possible questions we can consider when thinking about the life of faith, thinking about Christian spirituality, thinking about tradition. But I think this is one way, at least I'm going to encourage us to pick up this question as a way to launch us on a journey, a journey of discovery about who God is and who we are. Let's start with the journey of faith. For the nerds out there, you'll recognize this scene hidden in the background. I won't spoil it. You can talk to me afterwards. Theology. What is it? We talk about it a lot, or maybe we don't talk about it. Maybe we teach in the theology department here. Maybe we're theology majors or minors or have to take a theology class, and we still don't know what it is we're talking about. But for our purposes this evening, I want to make it very simple. I want to say that theology is quite simply and literally talking about God. It's something that we're all engaged in, whether we realize it or not, whenever we talk about our faith and we talk about the tradition. And as I suggest here, those of you way in the back don't, probably can't read it, you have your binoculars out. It's, it's origin, it's etymological, uh, what is it? I was going to say entomological, well that's the study of ants, right? Etymological roots uh, are the Greek words for God and talk about or the study of, the focus of. And, and so in this case, when we do theology, we are talking about God. And conversely, whenever we talk about God, invoke God's name, whatever that may be, we are doing theology. You don't have to be a professional to do theology. And this quest, this journey of faith, is something that's as old as uh, human experience of faith and reflection is. I mean, we can go back to the Hebrew scriptures, to the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, and look, for example, in the collective prayers of this community. Take, for example, Psalm 63, something we pray together very often in the liturgy. O oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I think those of you out here in California can relate to that, unfortunately, too well. Because your steadfast love is in fact better than life, my lips will praise you. And so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. We have this consistent sense of journey, this quest to talk about God, to understand who God is, reflected in a longing, a human desire to connect with our creator and a desire, as we hear in the voice of the psalmist in Psalm 63, a desire to call on God's name, to call God by name. But in order to pray this, at least consciously, we need to be mindful of the fact that we have to know God's name in order to call upon it, right? No? Okay, I'm going to say the same thing I said at Mass last night. Some of the students know what I'm about to say. I, like so many of you, 
I know people are getting really nervous now. Why is he walking out here? I spend so much time in front of TVs and iPhones and computers that I forget that in situations like this, I can see you. So feel free to like raise your hand or nod or you know that sort of thing. Some of you not into it, that's fine. We'll move along. But anyways, let's try this again. For those paying attention, I got some, some thumbs up in the back. Thank you, sir. All right. We have to know something about God's name in order to call upon God's name. True or false? Good. All right. So it's not just the Hebrew Bible. It's not just the Old Testament, not just our Psalms. It's in the early Christian tradition as well. This is a name that may be familiar to many of you. St. Augustine of Hippo, right? Augie. We're good friends. We can call each other by nicknames. He calls me Danny. I call him Augie. He asks this question as well in his famous spiritual autobiography, this real great work of theology, talking about God. Augustine writes, my love of you, God, is not some vague feeling. And in a way, we kind of get that sense in popular culture at times, right? That religion or spirituality isn't really some sense about a vague feeling. But Augustine, even some 1600 years ago, recognized that, no, my love of you, God, is not, in fact, this vague feeling. It is positive and it is certain. Your words struck into my heart, he writes, and from that moment I loved you. Besides this, all around me, heaven and earth and all that they contain, they proclaim that I should love you. And then he asks this question, but what do I love when I love my God? It's the basic question of literal theology in talking about God, or as we see the psalmist in 63, to call upon God's name. What is it? Who is it that I love when I love my God? Now, in different religious traditions over various periods of time, people have proposed different alternative answers, right? I think of our Muslim sisters and brothers and the wonderful tradition of the 99 sacred names of God. Here are a few of the many precious names, the holy names of God. Allah, the greatest name, of course, right? In the tradition of Islam, the all-merciful, the absolute ruler, the source of peace, the guardian, the creator, the forgiving, the sustainer, the judge, the just, the mighty, the truth, the giver of life, and so on. I share this in some part because of the ecumenical and interreligious interfaith kinship that we share as sisters and brothers of a common uh, Abrahamic tradition, that this quest to know the name of God and to answer Augustine's question of what do I love when I love my God is not limited just to the Christian communities. But I also share this with you because about 800 years ago, there was a small man from the Umbrian region of what is now called Italy who made what I'm wearing right now and Father Gino, what he's wearing right now, very fashionable. In fact, I'm surprised that only the two of us are wearing this very popular outfit. I knew that this was going to be a, a risky thing because it's the fall 2015 season and everybody knows that brown goes with, you know, the autumn time of year. So thank you, Gino. You're, you're right on top of it in terms of fashion sense. The rest of you, I don't know. <laughs> Francis of Assisi was deeply moved, informed, and impressed by what he experienced in a peaceful and interreligious in interaction with the Sultan, Sultan Malak Achamil in Damietta, Egypt during the Fifth Crusade. And in addition to several other things that he writes about and incorporates in his rule or way of life for us Franciscan friars and for those inspired by Francis's way of living the gospel, he composed himself a series of names for God, what, he, what is called today the praises of God. And it echoes, in a sense, what our Muslim sisters and brothers share in identifying some various options, some perhaps incomplete, but also very insightful clues about what Augustine was seeking after. Francis of Assisi writes, and this is just an excerpt, it's pretty lengthy, that God, you are love, charity, wisdom, you are humility, patience, beauty, meekness, you are security, you are rest, you are gladness and joy, you are our hope, you are justice. Again, we hear so many of the similar and same at times themes and names for God. You are moderation, 
You are all our riches to sufficiency. You are beauty and meekness, the protector, our custodian and defender. You are strength, refreshment. You are our hope and our faith. You are our charity. You are all our sweetness. You are our eternal life. Great and wonderful Lord, almighty God, and in a spirit that is so fitting as we prepare for a year of mercy, you are our merciful Savior. Francis of Assisi, like St. Augustine, like so many others, like you and I, whether we realize it or not, are on this quest, this journey of faith to understand the answer to Augustine's question. What or who do I love when I love my God? Now, there are other answers that have appeared throughout the centuries, and some of these will be more familiar to you than others, perhaps. In the Middle Ages, people like Thomas Aquinas, that Dominican, oh, all right, we got to acknowledge him. Franciscans are like, oh, all right, he's good, he's great, fine. He's a big proponent of the fact that to identify who God is or what God is is to suggest that God is pure being in Latin essay, you know, existence. Others, however, may be familiar with these other attributes of God. In answering Augustine's question, what or who do I love when I love my God, we respond with the all-powerful, omnipotence, or the all-knowing, the omniscient, and so on, the all-loving, the all-merciful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is distinguishing about God? Well, God is uncreated. To borrow from the Greek philosophical tradition, some people suggest, well, God is the unmoved mover. Thomas points to this as perhaps one way to think about or approach God. But then we have this other one that creeps up all the time, one that should also be pretty familiar to you, and that's I am. You've heard this before, right? See, some people know that I can see you. I am, which is oftentimes a translation of the tetragrammaton, these four letters in Hebrew that out of respect for our Jewish sisters and brothers, we Christians are invited to not pronounce because God's name is ineffable. We don't pronounce this name. There are other words that are used to substitute this YHWH, as we might put it. Adonai, meaning Lord, or Hashem, simply meaning the name. So when we refer to God, we use these substitutes. But I am, as it appears in our English translations of this book. Have you heard of this, the Bible? New York Times bestseller? Still? Yeah. It's amazing. I don't know. Some people don't. You'd be surprised. I won't mention names, but it's, it's new reading for some people. It appears to us in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So when people for centuries have asked, what is God's name? This is kind of the go-to place, Exodus 3.14. I want to give you a little bit of just some context, so we got to go over the story, right? Do you remember what's going on in Exodus 3.14? What's happening? The well, the Exodus, very good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Duh, I gave it away. It's in the name. Yeah. What else is happening? So Moses is tending his sheep, right? At this point, Moses is, okay, Moses is doing something. We're in chapter 3, yeah. There's a burning bush. Yeah, there's the other clue. You got the Exodus part. There's a burning bush. So this scene, what happens in the, with the burning bush scene? Now, come on. Charlton Heston, let my people go. You've all seen it. Ten Commandments. What's going on in this scene? Well, Moses does not yet know Yahweh, and this is when... Uh, Sorry about the word. Uh, I am first calls Moses and says, you know, you are in the presence of holiness and I am calling you. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this what we call in kind of like theological technical jargon, a theophany, right? A revealing of God's name, a disclosure of who God is to Moses, the one who's called to a special mission. And I love it that you mentioned that you're standing on holy ground is one of the first things. You know, Moses was kind of rude, stepping in God's place, God's home. God says, take off your shoes. Don't track the mud in here, right? Very concerned about that. He didn't want to clean this up afterwards. So, yeah, standing on holy ground, God's calling Moses. But there's a part of this that we oftentimes overlook, and it's really important. I think it's important because it says something about you and me as people striving to be faithful members of the same kind of call like Moses receives. And that's every single prophet, all of them, every single one, with maybe the exception of John the Baptist, but let's just say all the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures 
don't want to be prophets. Every single one of them, including Moses. Like, we're so used to saying, oh, yeah, Moses, he's the one that leads the people 40 years in the desert. So uh, we skip over some stuff. You know, there's some great examples. My favorite is Jeremiah of the other prophets. So God calls Jeremiah right at the opening. And Jeremiah, he's, you know, God's calling Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, ah, Lord, mm, I think you've got the wrong guy. I'm too young. Now you see why I like him, right? I'm too young. I don't speak well. You should get somebody else. And God says, shut up. You think you know better than me? That's my translation. That's not actually in there. But, but God says, trust me. I will put my words in your mouth. I have known you from the time you were in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I called you to this, which is my translation of shut up. You think you know better than me, right? And then we all know Jonah, right? We know the Jonah story, all oh, whales and this kind of like Pinocchio, this whole, this whole sort of thing. But what we forget is that he's in the most kind of deliberate and literal way, turns away from God, walks in the opposite direction. And as we know, can't escape God's call, can't escape the vocation that's been presented to him. So too with Moses. In fact, Moses tries to get out of the prophetic call five times. And this is one of those five times. And he is probably, in my opinion at least, the most clever of all these prophets. I like Jeremiah the best, but Moses is pretty smart. He knows that God's name is unspeakable. They don't have a name in the same way that maybe idolaters would, right? And so Moses, realizing he wants to wiggle out of this prophetic call, he, you know, I mean, who really wants to go up against Pharaoh? And as we read, you know, further on in Exodus, right, all Pharaoh's chariots and charioteers, oh, please, can't be bothered with that. So Moses says, I know what I'll do. God, yeah, be very happy to be your prophet, to go talk to Moses, you know, lead your people into freedom and so on and so forth. But I just got one question, just a little logistical detail. I got to work this out with you. Please, please be patient with me. When they ask me, you know, because they're gonna, they're gonna ask me, the Pharaoh's gonna want to know. When they ask me who sent me, what do I tell them? And what does God say in response? I am. I am. Right? Sort of. Sort of. God says to Moses, I am, or I am who I am, or I am who am, depending on the translation. That's true. That appears in Exodus 3.14. But that's not the whole story. We'll come back to that. Let's move first to what we can't know about. Because I want to set some ground rules here. If we're going to be talking about the name of God, if we're going to be talking about prophets and calls, if we're going to be talking about trying to figure this out and knowing more about the whole story, well, we've got to set some rules. And here we look to the great theologian from Fordham University, Sister Elizabeth Johnson, who has written a lot about the name of God. Really, really helpful, insightful, great stuff. And she gives us three rules, and I point to her because this is just, I think, summarizes it so clearly. She says, first of all, God is an ineffable mystery beyond all telling. God is first and foremost mystery that we can't figure out. And God is first and foremost ineffable, which is kind of what Moses realized when he was trying to trick God, right? God's name can't be spoken, can't be expressed in its fullness. That moves us to second, uh, rule number two, the second rule, which unlike Fight Club is not talk about Fight Club, but instead is no expression for God can be taken literally. None. Why? Because to do so would be to violate rule number one, which is to kind of wrap our heads around completely this ineffable mystery. God is so far beyond us in some ways that we can't, in fact, express the who or what God is in absolute completeness. So any expression we have for God will be somewhat falling short of the mark. And because of that, we slip into rule number three. It's a great transition, which is, it is necessary to give God many names. As we saw in those 99 sacred names of God, as we saw in Francis of Assisi's own prayer, as we might experience in our own prayer life and tradition, one won't cut it. No human concept, just to reiterate this, again, what we mean by ineffable mystery, no human concept, word, or image 
all of which originate in the experience of created reality, our everyday lived experience, none of this can totally encapsulate or circumscribe the divine reality, nor can any human construct express with any measure of adequacy the mystery of God who is indeed ineffable. These are humbling rules to remind us of this kind of treacherous journey of faith, this quest we're on to answer Augustine's question. There's a, a Protestant theologian named Sally McFaig who says this, and I love this quote about there's no literal expression for God. She says, there is no end to the being, fullness, and mystery of God. There's an ancient expression that when you think you've figured out God, that's exactly when you've lost it. You've missed it. It's gone. So whatever theory we use, whatever method we come up with to try to express this who or what we love when we love our God, whether it's an analogy, you know, not to be confused, what was it, Chevy or Ford that had that commercial, like a rock? Anyone? Anyone? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, yeah. We're still live, right? Okay. Or a metaphor, you know, we can talk about, you know, God is love, as we see in the New Testament. Or a symbol which reflects something much more strong or any kind of combination of this. The wisdom of this second rule is that we're always naming toward God pointing toward this absolute mystery of love, the absolute creator that we can't ever wrap our heads around 100%. And then this abundance of images for God. The key, of course, is to avoid idolatry. God may be like a rock, but God is not a rock, right? And scripture provides an abundance of these images for God. God, male and female, God appears in maternal language and paternal language, like mother, like father. We have human and non-human images. God is like a rock. Well, that's not very human, but we can say that God is like our friend or companion. The Song of Songs describes the relationship between humanity and our creator in a very romantic way, right? Mystics in the Middle Ages did so as well, and some may have those experiences today. Uh, you can talk about that in private later. I don't shout that out. But St. Augustine said, as I mentioned earlier, that if you have understood, it is not God. That's that expression. The New Testament shows this to us, too. All these rules kind of in summary. St. Paul kind of encapsulates all of this. When St. Paul says in the first letter to the Corinthians that right now we see as if in a mirror darkly. We see partially, incompletely. We don't get the whole picture. But someday we'll see completely. We'll see God face to face. And as the Orthodox Catholic theologian David Bentley Hart says, that this concept, the concept of God, is often just as obscure to those who want to believe, the faithful, the practicing Christians, or members of other faith traditions, as well as those who want not to believe. The question of God never ceases to pose itself anew. Again, St. Augustine, if you've understood, it is not God. And that longing to know about God never wholly abates. It's never completely satisfied. Now, now that I'm done, we can all go home disappointed. <laughs> Just kidding. That was what we can't know about. The mystery of God in completeness. But instead, now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and say who we can know. Because we can know a who. This guy, Thomas Merton, how many people have heard of him before? Yeah, all right. Well, then next time you're asked, everyone can raise their hand. He's awesome. This would be his 100th birthday this past January. We're celebrating a centenary year, a Trappist monk, uh, an author, a great social critic. He was somebody, one of the four people that Pope Francis mentioned in that historic meeting or that addressed to the joint session of Congress as key American models, right, of freedom, of justice, of Christian living. And he mentioned whom? He mentioned Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, woo, and Thomas Merton, woo, woo. I was very excited. I like Thomas Merton, as Erin mentioned in her very kind introduction. But Thomas Merton, I think, highlights some of who we can know and the difference between the who and the what and these questions and how we wrap our heads around God. Merton points, says really well that God is not a what. God is not a thing. 
And that is precisely one of the essential characteristics of contemplative experience, of praying, of the act of being on that journey of faith. Contemplation or prayer sees that there is no what that can be called God. There is no such thing as God. Now that'll be tweeted and somebody will say, oh, Father Dan said there's no such thing as God. Retweet. I'll hear about that tonight. But he continues, there's no such thing as God because God is neither a what nor a thing, but a pure who. God is the thou before whom our inmost I springs into awareness. God is the I am before whom with our own self, our own being must be personal and inalienable voice that we echo I am. It's an I am and an I am. It is a who, not a thing or a what. God is not an object among other objects to be studied or understood or to be grasped or to be figured out or to be labeled or to be named exclusively. God is a subject, a who, the I am, who is able to then enter into relationship. And perhaps, I might dare say, that our brother St. Augustine may have been a little off with this question. Augustine was off, I think, because God is not a what to be loved, what do I love when I love my God, but a partner in relationship. We are so conditioned, I think, without realizing it, to imagine God as an object to be studied or to be learned about. That's why the theology, the study of God, is a little misleading as well. It's really about knowing God. Not as a, you know, I don't know, just one other subject among others. But rather, again, this partner in relationship with whom we are called to, to a life and to a love of relationship and connection. So let me say something about to know about, to be known. Revelation is not the way to know about God. It is not material information. It's not facts, propositions, or figures, or as I like to say at times, it's not the Wikipedia of divinity. We don't know about God. Revelation instead, whether we're talking in this case, as I'm going to suggest, sacred scripture, is another way of talking about God's own self-disclosure, God's revealing who God is to us. It's the means by which, then, God is to be known, not just known about. I'll give you an example. There are a lot of people and things and ideas that we can know about. I don't know. What's a good example? Five years ago, I was teaching a class, and I talked about the difference between knowing about and knowing, and the idea of revelation and God's self-disclosure. And back then, one of the people that was all over the news was Kim Kardashian. Is she still around? Okay, right? I really don't know about her. I know of her, of her name. But I would say to the, to the students, right, you can know a lot about Kim Kardashian, but there's a difference between knowing all the facts and figures. You're like the best fan, the biggest fan. You run a Facebook like group that's like got thousands of followers and so on. But it's different from knowing the person, right? We can all agree. We, we make that distinction. We understand that difference. Well, the same thing is true when talking about God, that revelation isn't simply a list of propositions, facts, details, descriptions that describe something about something, in this case, the biggest, greatest, most wonderful something that we call God. Instead, revelation is the language, it's the name that we give to coming to know God's sharing of God's very self with us. And sometimes we talk about that as grace, the experience of God's revelation in our life. Why don't you hold that just for our question in a second? Why don't you write it down? Yeah, we'll have a QA and a in a moment. Yeah. I love it, though. You're ready to go. See, this guy knows we're live. Christian faith affirms, right, at our core that the holy mystery that we call God does not remain distant and abstract. You may have heard this expression before. There there are groups of people who identify themselves as atheists. They don't believe in God. And when somebody asks, well, what don't you believe in? They list all these things, you know, some 
clock maker out in the distant land who kind of wound up creation and then let it go and is not connected, whatever, and so on and so forth. And all these descriptors are typically things that people of faith also don't believe in. I'm very comfortable saying I also don't believe in the God that most self-proclaimed atheists don't believe in. We believe, however, right? The Christian tradition upholds that God is not some sort of removed, distant, uncaring deity, but rather draws near as a loving personal presence. And that's most fully realized in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. The famous Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner famously claimed and he asserted that we can only know about God, these facts and details, by reflecting on our, what he calls, transcendental experience of the holy mystery. That's fancy jargon for saying simply, we can only know anything about God by being in relationship with God. The same is really true about our own experience of relationship in this world. You only really get to know the truth about somebody by knowing them in relationship. The Bible, remember this thing? <laughs> Some people have fallen asleep. Yes, yeah, oh yeah, the Bible, right, right, right. The Bible is the historical medium then of divine revelation. What does that mean? What that means is that this this is the way in which we, for centuries, for millennia, have passed on the story, the narrative of God revealing who God is to us from one generation to the next, into the next generation, into the next generation. The Bible offers us a glimpse, a reflection into who God is and what God's name is. And it's a story meant to be lived and not merely learned. We mistakenly at times, I think, in the popular imagination, think the Bible is like a bunch of, like, I don't know, a printed Wikipedia, some kind of set of facts. And we miss the deeper truth that is conveyed in sacred scripture, which is who God is, that God reveals God's self to creation to you and I. And that's what brings us back to this name of God business. Let's go back, in fact, to that burning bush scene, Exodus 3.14. So those gathered together to share the collective story of God's love for us might hear how God revealed the, to Moses God's name, a name so holy that it shouldn't be said, a name signified by those four letters, Y-H-W-H, which has come to be translated centuries later in our English as I am. And that may be where we typically stop the story, but the original hearers of the story may have understood the complexities and richness of God's name that may have been lost in translation over these centuries, may have been forgotten through centuries of selective memory. What do I mean by that? Do you know? You know the answer, of course, right? To what God says in verse 14 in chapter 3. But do you know what appears in, in verse 15 of chapter 3? God spoke to Moses after God says, I am. Thus shall you say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Remember the situation. Moses is trying to trick God. Who should I say sent me? This is my name forever. This is my title for all generations, God says to Moses. Oh, but that's not it. God continues. Go and assemble the elders of the Israelites and tell them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me and said, I am concerned about you and about the way you are being treated in Egypt. So I've decided to lead you up out of the misery of Egypt into the land flowing with milk and honey. The name of God, this is my name forever, this is my title for all generations, is precisely who God is. It is a God who is with us. It is a God who has been there with us. It is a God who loves us and who will be there for us. And this is made even clearer as we read beyond 
verse 14 in chapter 3 through the next couple verses. Oh, we like to shut God off where we find it most comfortable, right? This is God's real name, I'm going to suggest, relationship. When we don't just stop with that I am of 314, but we read on to hear God explain who God is to Moses, we come to see that God is the one concerned about us in the way we are treated. God cares. Very different from that distant, removed, kind of unmoved mover, abstract philosophical God. God is not some abstract deity, but a creator who is, I would suggest, head over heels in love with humanity and seeks what is best for creation out of that love and out of that concern. I hear your cries. I know who you are. And as I've said, and I'm going to repeat again, God is not some philosophical abstraction. But as God says to Moses, this is my name forever. The name of God is relationship. As the late theologian Catherine Lacuna said, the incomprehensible God is God. Who God is, is God by sharing, bestowing, diffusing, expressing God's very self. The gift of existence and grace that God imparts to the world is not produced by efficient causality, not some sort of secondary or kind of, you know, kind of tangential sort of process that's largely extrinsic to God. Rather, the gift that God gives us is nothing other than God's own self. Who is this God? And I would suggest to us that this, what is this again? Okay, eight people out of like 300. Oh my gosh, all right. I know, everyone's thinking, especially in the back, I didn't know there was gonna be a quiz tonight. All of this, all of sacred scripture, if it's the means by which the historical medium, that which is divinely inspired, the collection of the story of God revealing who God is to us passed on from generation to generation, I would insist that all of sacred scripture then is a remembering of this, the real name of God, God's true name at every turn. So I want to give an example. Where better to begin then at the beginning of the Bible, that's at the book that's called Beginning, that begins with the line, in the beginning, otherwise known as? Genesis. Good, yeah, see, some people are getting A's. Yeah. The people in the back are like, well, I didn't sign up for this course. Are we getting credit for it? What's going on here? So, you know, you know this line, right? You're familiar with the opening of Genesis, you know, even if you don't realize it. I'll get you started, right? You just nod along. Remember, I can see you. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, God said, let there be light, right? No, I tricked you. Yeah, somebody didn't, somebody knew. No, but we think that, right? Because then it becomes evening came and morning followed the next day, the next day, the next day, right? And then God said it was all good. But I tricked you on purpose because there's a little passage in there that's easy to overlook, a line, actually the second part of the first sentence that in our collective imagination, we skip over. Let me read to you how the book at the beginning of the Bible that's called Beginning, Beginning Within the Beginning begins. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While, in this translation, a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. I share this passage with you because it's the first sentence of the canonical scriptures of our Bible. And at the very beginning of this book that begins in the beginning is a sign of a God who is desiring more than anything else to draw near to creation, to humanity. In the original Hebrew, see, we lose so much in translation. What we see here is this tohu wa bohu, this void, this chaotic kind of disordered mess, we might say, without future or organization, without hope, without structure. There's a dark deepness, a tehom in Hebrew that we see here too. And there is nothing. It's a wasteland, this translation puts it. But where does creation begin? It begins with and I don't like this part of this translation, of the wind from God, which in Hebrew is the Ruach Elohim, the very breath of God. 
a sign in the Hebrew Bible of divine imminence of a God who draws near and close to creation. It is that very Godness, God's self, God's breath, God's spirit that brings order into creation. And then God says, let there be light. But before all that business of evening came and morning followed, God draws near to this creation, gives hope, structure, organization, skill, and so on. That's Genesis chapter 1. Let's move to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be here all night, by the way. <laughs> we have a different version, right? So spoiler alert, there are two creation narratives that are not exactly the same. The evening came and morning followed of chapter 1 involves no snakes, no fig leaves, no apples. You know what I'm talking about, right? Now we're moving a little bit more into that. The second creation account is where God creates human beings, ha adama, from the earth. And I always like to point out, and some of you know this well already, that Adam is not a proper noun. Adam means earthling, earth creatures, made of dust, what you hear every Ash Wednesday. You know, people get awkward about that. You know, some, you know there's an alternative, right? They say, ooh, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Ooh, I don't like that. That's creepy. I don't want to do that. So they say, okay. Be faithful to the gospel, turn away from sin or something like that. And you're like, well, that's okay. No dust is involved. I don't have to remember it. It's all right. A little more PC or something. But I always like to say, no, it's not bad news. It's not creepy. It's, it's where we came from. God creates us from the earth, ha adama. And how are we given life? Yes. With that very same symbol of divine imminence. That ruach, that breath of God. God's very being is what's given to us to give us life and animate us. God desires to draw near to us so much so that it's not just God who kind of floats in like a wind and organizes the chaos and then floats back out to outer space or whatever. But in this account, we get another picture, another glimpse at the deep truth and profound recognition of the real name of God, which is God desires to be close to us so much that God's very breath is our breath. Now, the University of San Diego has a great nursing school. I know that. I saw the billboard outside, and I know there may be some nursing students here. I will tell you that I am not a nurse or a medical professional at all, so don't listen to anything I say. Consult a doctor or a medical professional for any advice. But I seem to recall that at one point, when I was younger, I know, some people were thinking, when you were younger, please. But when I was even younger, and I learned CPR for the first time, you're instructed to do chest compressions and breaths, right? Ring a bell. And I understand that if you still have two people, that that's the way you do it, right? But now I guess the instruction is you just do chest compressions or something, I don't know. Again, don't go consult medical professionals. The point is to bring this up that this is a great image to talk not only about the life that's given to another, but the intimacy of breathing with and for another person. That if we start to think about God's creating us, not only from the earth, which is a recognition of what we share, what science has told us too about the fact that we are literally stardust, the same carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and so on that makes up our body is what makes up everything else. We share that in common. We're not aliens placed from without, despite what the History Channel programs tell us. <laughs> and that like the CPR, like the breath-to-breath -breath resuscitation or mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, God's very breath, God is kind of giving us that life, breathing in and with and for us. And this reflects, I think, another truth that St. Augustine talks about when Augustine says that you, God, you are the one who is closer to me than I am to myself. God desires to draw near to us, close to us. Now on to Genesis chapter 3. Just kidding. We'll move to the New Testament. So the Christmas comes around, right? It's coming soon, right? How many shopping days left? Apparently, the local stores think zero because they already have trees up and candy. It's, it's absurd, right? Um, but, you know, there are four kind of Christmas liturgy flavors. People go to Mass on Christmas, right? You go to church, and you usually pick which Mass you're going to depending on your disposition, right? There's the afternoon liturgy, the vigil on Christmas Eve, and that's usually kind of infiltrated by a bunch 
tons, really, like busloads of little sheep and shepherds and wise men and women and little Marys and Josephs and babies. You know what I'm talking about, right? That's the live nativity, and it's a packed house, and it's a circus. It's the tohu wabohu of Christmas liturgies. Chaos. So you may or may not go to that one. And then there's the other one, right? The next one is the midnight mass or the midnight mass at 10 p.m., right? Let's be honest, yeah. <laughs> And then some people go to that, but even at 10 p.m., it's kind of late, they've been drinking some wine, it's Christmas Eve, they're like, oh, well, in the morning, and they want a quiet mass, and you go to the 7 o'clock sunrise, like early mass, you know, but it's no way no longer daylight like savings, so there is no sunrise, it's just Christmas in the dark. And then there's all the rest of the masses throughout the day, the 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. And for each of those liturgies, there's a different set of readings. You should go all four times, just check it out. Yeah. Christmas Eve, we get the story of sheep and shepherds and so on, but the, all the masses during the day after that first morning mass have two interesting readings, two very important ones that involve no shepherds, no sheep, no rooms in the inn, no donkeys, no wise men, no nothing. What we get is in the second reading, the letter to the Hebrews, the very opening, and then the gospel is the prologue to the gospel according to St. John. These are super important. Because they remind us, of course, of what Scripture is all about, and that's remembering God's name. I'll remind you, the letter to the Hebrews begins this way. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various and partial ways by the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created all things. He is the reflection of God's glory in the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. Then we come to the gospel. And this is another in the beginning. It's familiar to so many of us, right? In the beginning was the word. Yeah, I saved you guys because we already know already that Genesis is in the beginning. Sometimes I trick you. In the beginning, I'm talking about Genesis, you know, was the word of God? Oh, I gotcha. No, it's a different problem. We'll get to that later. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We know this. Here, John, of course, is setting up what's to come, the prologue, setting the stage. And we get to, I don't know why this is, always, verse 14, the kind of high point, right? The pinnacle of the prologue, the end. And the word became flesh and made his love among us, pitched his tent among us, lived in the world as one of us. And then we say, that's the end, all right, except it's not. Except there are four more verses. And at the very end of the prologue, verse 18, we get an echo of what we see in the letter to the Hebrews in that opening. We read that no one has ever seen God, but it is God, the only Son, who is at the Father's right hand and close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. In the beginning, previously, before the incarnation, God made God's self known to us in various ways through the prophets, through creation, through the world around us, through the experience of human love. There's always been a sense of who God is, God revealing God's self, disclosing God's self to us. But now, in the incarnation, we reach the pinnacle. God desires so much to be in relationship, to live up to God's very name, that God actually enters the world as one of us. As we read elsewhere in Scripture, God, who is all these things, right, all powerful, all knowing, all loving, and so on, decides to let go of that, surrenders that, takes on our human form, becomes one of us, to be in relationship in the most complete and absolute way. And that's the reason for the season celebrating and remembering that God's name is relationship and that God lives up to God's name. What we see in the letter to the Hebrews and we see in John's prologue and elsewhere is that Christ is, to use the kind of technical language, the full exegesis, the full expression. We use this language exegesis to talk about the meaning of Scripture, to pull out, to kind of expand, to understand the depth and richness of what we read. But Christ is, in that Greek of John's gospel, the full expression of God. Christ makes God present fully. But what's also interesting is that Christ makes humanity present fully. 
Because we profess, right, Christians, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human, right? And if that's true, and we say that Jesus Christ is the full expression of divinity, of God, then we also have to say Jesus Christ is the full expression of humanity. That's why that verse in 18 comes at the end of the prologue. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to know how God loves and what's important to God and what's not important to God, keep reading the story. And also, if you want to know what it's like to be fully human, keep reading the story. See how Jesus acts and lives in the world. And in the Gospels, at every turn, at every time, we see what? Jesus prioritizing relationship. Not just to reveal God's way of being and what's important to God and the priorities of God, but also to reveal to us how we're to live. Especially those of us who dare to call ourselves Christians, to walk in those footprints of the Lord. So the name, relationship. Relationship is one, I would suggest, among many insightful and helpful, but always incomplete names for God. Yet I think it is the name that is revealed in God's very actions, right? We want to know what God's like. Look at the sun. And it's modeled for us, for humanity, who God is through the incarnation. And I think it can change our way of thinking about our relationship to God and our relationship to one another and who we are in some very important ways. And this is where I'm going to stop talking. The first is scripture. That we need to reimagine what scripture is all about. Not an answer book, but a story. And not a story that's untrue, but a story that's so true that we get to see who God is because it's how we pass on from one generation to the next God's disclosure of who God is. It should change the way we think about the incarnation. In a couple weeks, everyone's going to be talking about the reason for the season. Keep Christ in Christmas, blah, blah, blah. Here's my bumper sticker, yada, yada, right? And that's good and that's important, but let's remember the full reason for the season, that it's God's love. The reason for the incarnation is that God's head over and heels in love with humanity and creation and desires to enter into it, to be in relationship with us in the most full, complete way we can experience as human beings. It should inf uh, impact, it should shape, I hope, our prayer lives as well to think about God's name as relationship. Going back to St. Augustine's sort of reflection and concern, whom do we address when we pray? And how? How do we pray? Do we pray to a God who lives up to God's name, who always desires to draw near to us and is, in fact, as St. Augustine says, already right now closer to us than we can be to ourselves? And then I hope, and this is the whole point of Jesus' mission, living the will of the Father, right, is that it should shape our way of seeing one another. We are called to prioritize relationship, not just with God, but with God, with one another, and with all of creation. Thank you.